All right. I think we are ready to go. We are just a couple minutes after seven tonight. And thank you everyone for tuning in to our first in a series of CNF AIC forecaster chats. I'm excited for tonight for our special guest. We'll be talking weather and how to forecast our perfect powder day. But before that, my name is Wendy Wagner and I am the director of the Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center. Our office is down in Girdwood and we forecast for Turnigan Pass and surrounding areas up to Girdwood. We have two other forecasters on our staff and we will be hosting these chats over the next month or so. Our next one is going to be December 15th and our lead forecaster, Olive Johnston Bloom, will be hosting that. She's gonna be getting into a topic that will continue the next chats and that is looking into the avalanche problems. You probably all have seen on our advisory page, we break up what kind of avalanche, we break up the avalanche into what kinds of avalanches to expect out there. And sometimes that can be a bit tricky because we can have a lot of different types of avalanches and some can, some are definitely more dangerous than others. So Olaf is gonna start with that in a couple of weeks. But tonight we are coming back to the weather thing for the most part. And as you may know, we often every fall or every early winter will go into local businesses and shops and we do these in-person outreach events, lesson learned stories, avalanche awareness, things like that. But because this is a different, different early season and we're not meeting in person, unfortunately, we're doing this virtual. Uh, so thank you again for being here tonight. We do really want to keep the connection with the community and already with how many people have been sending in observations and how much back and forth we've had over email or on the phone and on these uh, snow stories and on these chats, it's really awesome. It sounds like we have, I think maybe over a hundred people tuning in tonight. So um, that's great. Um, before we kick things off, I want to thank our co-host, Ski AK. Ski AK is um, a big sponsor of the Avalanche Center for many, many years now. As you may or may not know, they carry a whole host of Avalanche rescue gear. So if you're looking to upgrade or you're looking to get some shovel beacon pr probe airbag or whatnot, they have very knowledgeable staff and go in and check things out at Ski AK. So thanks again. For to those folks for co-hosting tonight. We also co-hosting is uh, the Friends of the CNF AIC. That's our nonprofit partner. And we do have one board member here tonight. His name is Wade Phillips, and he's actually the guru behind the Zoom webinar. And he's gonna say a few words on behalf of the Friends group. Wade. All right, thanks, Wendy. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm really excited to hear about um, some weather resources tonight and um, I'm getting really excited for the ski season here and I hope you all are as well. Um, the friends of the CNFAIC uh, work hard all winter long to help the forecasters uh, maintain their uh, the weather stations to raise funds to support the forecaster salaries and to make sure that you all have a daily forecast. So we could really use your help. It's a challenging time for fundraising. Um, so please, please come um, and donate. I'm gonna post our um, link to our donation page on the website here in the chat. Um, if you haven't, or if you can spare a few extra bucks, please jump in, renew your membership. And um, yeah, let's have a great winter out there. Thanks, Wendy. Great, thanks Wade. So I'm gonna start things off with a little PowerPoint. Um, I was actually gonna do a little recap of last season, but it turns out this season started early. It started off with a bang and we already have quite a bit of snow out there. So if folks hopefully can see that screen. This is sort of the plan of attack for tonight. I'm gonna just give a little update on current avalanche conditions, and then we're gonna jump into the meat of the program, which is Kyle's tools and tips to find your powder day and a look ahead at our winter weather outlook. And if I just take away those words there, we can see this nice photo. This is 
Upper California Creek down in the Girdwood area. It's by Meg Smith. Meg took this picture on November 13th, and I'm not sure how many folks remember, but we had some early season snow in late October, and that snow sat around, faceted, got quite sugary, and then about November 10th, 11th, we had about a foot and a half of snow, and that's the snow you see in this photo. And so after that storm, we saw some avalanche activity, things were running on those, what we are calling the October facets. And so that was the first sign of, the, of what was to come. So that was November 13th. Now we'll skip ahead a week because that snow sat around for a week in cold, clear weather. And then we got another dump. We started snowing on November 19th. And by early November 22nd, we had another two feet of snow on the ground. And remember that old week snow from October, that's now sitting a couple feet deep to three feet deep in places. And people probably will find this photo somewhat familiar. Henry Munter took it. And this is tin cans, common bowl on the left, just with some tracks in out of view. And then this is tin cans, hippie bowl. Anyhow, this is a large avalanche that was triggered remotely from quite a ways away. I don't know if you can see my arrow there, but a skier was skiing down, remotely triggered that large avalanche. It also triggered this pocket down here. And um, that is the October facets was the culprit in that slide. So that's been our concern. Um, that exact, that was an exciting day that November 22nd because on Sunburst, this is Sunburst Ridge here, um, this is what folks call the cornice line, but there was a skier that skied down this steeper terrain and triggered this large avalanche that released near the ground as well. Luckily, that skier was able to escape. No one was caught. And lastly, on November 22nd, there was another large remotely triggered avalanche, and it was triggered, I think, near the top and the side um, somewhere. And this avalanche actually released in on some buried surface ore that was in the old new snow interface. And so that was another layer we were also concerned about. So we kind of have a couple of layers in the snowpack that are a little bit older now that were quite reactive a couple weeks ago. Interestingly enough, about five, four days after that exciting um, period of human triggered avalanches, we had about a foot of snow and we had a whole bunch of wind and we had a natural avalanche on the north face of Sunburst here. Um, you can see it was triggered by a wind slab just out of view and that pulled out an avalanche to the ground again releasing in, the, in those October facets. So if anyone has been paying attention to the avalanche forecast for the last several weeks, you'll know we've been tracking this layer at the ground We've also been tracking that buried surface ore that doesn't look like it's been doing a whole lot in the Turnigan area lately, which is good news. But, um, but what I also wanted to show is we have a new forecaster, Andrew Shower. He's on the left there. And then we have Olive Johnston Bloom, who's been a, our lead forecaster for several years now. And they are both pointing at that old week snow at the ground that has been our kind of our um, main pain to deal with lately. But if you can imagine, these photos were taken before there was five to seven feet of snowfall. So there is a lot of snow out there right now, believe it or not. This is what it looked like yesterday, right before things warmed up last night. So hopefully, it sounds like it didn't rain too much at the pass. We're really hoping it doesn't rain too high because that was the forecast. And we're going to get into the meteorology speak in a minute here with Kyle, but just want to leave everyone with a quick recap of the avalanche activity we've had in the turning and pass area and everybody keep thinking cold thoughts because we do want to keep the snow falling at sea level and we want to stay away from that r word so now we're going to get into kyle's presentation Many of you have, are probably familiar with Kyle Van Pearsom, but he is a local meteorologist for the National Weather Service. He's also the Avalanche Program Lead for the Anchorage Weather Forecast Office, and he teaches every now and again for the Alaska Avalanche School. He does have a graduate degree in snow science, believe it or not, so he's a skier, 
He's a snow scientist, a meteorologist, and he also has a couple years of being an avalanche forecaster down in California and Montana. And please, uh, we are going to utilize the chat. We really want this to be uh, informative discussion. And we also have a Q&A box there, too, for question and answer. We can, we're going to have some time at the end to answer questions. But feel free to put them in during Kyle's talk in, uh, in there. Or also utilize that chat. All right, Kyle. All right. Well, thanks, Wendy. Uh, let me get my video started here. Yeah, thanks again for taking time All away right. from your family and yeah. giving us this weather talk. Anytime. I love talking about weather and trying to forecast it. So let me get my screen shared here and get my presentation going. All right. Can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up. Um, yep, got it. Good. Good. All right. So as Wendy said, um, I work for the National Weather Service, kind of have a dual header role. I primarily am a meteorologist with the River Forecast Center, but I also um, work for the Weather Forecast Office, the Anchorage Weather Forecast Office. We're in the same building and kind of liaison between them and the avalanche community to help them uh, better support, um, provide weather support to the avalanche professionals in the area. So um, yeah, I'll get started. So I'm gonna talk about how you can use weather and how you can forecast weather to find, a, find your perfect powder day per se, um, and some of the tools and resources that you can use uh, to do that. So I started off this photo here, and maybe some of you recognize where it's from. Uh, I took this, this is just off of uh, the tin can, the main tin can up track last year. I think the up track is just on the other side of that. Uh, horizon line. But I show this photo because um, the weather was pretty bad that day, um, day before and that morning. But looking at the weather, I had a day or two to get out and I was trying to figure out when the best time would, would be to you know find a sucker hole, uh, find a, a clear patch to get in there and ski and some good visibility. And I was able to do that. It cleared out. A little bit of luck, um, but it ended up being a, a decent afternoon and had some good snow six and a half about six inches um, that day and so hopefully some of these tools and tips uh, you can use to to do the same thing and kind of uh, find a, a weather window to ski when the weather's good um, you don't have to be a meteorologist you don't have to have all this experience in weather to to do that so hopefully these tools and tips will help you kind of navigate that all right so weather in Alaska, we have a, as an outdoor recreation, recreational community, as recreationists, backcountry skiers, whatever, uh, we kind of have a love-hate relationship with the weather out here. So when the weather's good, it, it's awesome out here, right? The skiing's good, the, you know, we have just incredible terrain. Um, but when the weather goes south, it goes south really fast. So you can be going from skiing this to all of a sudden you're in a ping pong ball and you can't see where you're at. Um, and that's just the, the reality of our um, unpredictable and rapidly changing weather up here in Alaska. It's a tough place uh, to forecast for and the weather's just difficult. Um, so hopefully some of these tools will help you navigate that, you know, it's a safety issue. If you get caught up above tree line and you're completely socked in, uh, it can be dangerous, uh, especially if the wind's blowing like crazy. People that have been up on Denali, you know, 7,000 foot at base camp or 14,000 foot camp can probably attest to that, that the weather can change rapidly. And if you don't know it's coming, it could kill you. So where does everyone get their weather from? Where do they, you know, look at to figure out what the forecast is going to be. Most people more than likely have some app on their phone that they look at. Um, the, the problem is I think there's a lot of misinformation or confusion on where the weather is coming from on their app. Um, the reality is a lot of these apps, they're, they're good. They provide good information um, in a general sense. But when it comes down to specifics, especially up here in Alaska, they don't do that well. Um, when you're the, the details and the information that you need to make a decision and if you're going to, if it's safe to go up and ski somewhere up in the backcountry, you probably aren't going to 
get all everything that you need from the app on your phone. Some people might just look outside and decide whether it's good to go or not. As I said before, that weather can change really, really fast up here. Other people act like this guy. This is Alaska or a Florida guy, Florida man in the middle of a hurricane. Some people just say, you know what, it's going to be crappy, so I'm going to go out anyways and just deal with it. Um, but hopefully we can use uh, some resources, some good tools uh, to make informed decisions on when it's safe to go and when it's not safe to go and use that in conjunction uh, with uh, the avalanche forecast, if there is one, um, to help you make a good decision. So in the meteorology world, as a forecaster, we have this um, process to help us make a forecast. It's called the forecast funnel. And the premise behind it is you start, you start large on like a large global scale. And as you get closer in time, you're narrowing down your focus to say the mountain scale to a really small scale or even like a slope scale um, to help you figure out you know, exactly where and when uh, the weather is going to be good or if it's going to be good for the area you're going to. So you kind of start, you know, one to two weeks out, you look at certain things and as you get closer and closer and closer, you narrow in on to your specific objective, your location, and you start looking at different uh, tools, um, different resources that help you make that decision. So you go from, uh, from more of like a large scale pattern on the hemispheric scale down to a, you know, you can start looking at individual storm systems that are regional or state scale. And then as you get, you know, within 24 hours, you can start looking at thinking about local effects and how that's going to impact your specific uh, location of uh, where you're looking to go. So if you're looking to try to figure out what the weather is going to be and you're about, you know, more than one to two weeks out, there's not a lot of, not a lot of things you can look at. Um, the best advice I can give you is to look for regional you know, trends. Uh, so the Climate Prediction Center, um, they put out these charts and they, they're they kind of showing you, they're telling you, you know, what is the, the monthly or the, the weekly trend looking like? So the chart on the right here is showing you that they're saying the next six to 10 days, the temperature um, is likely to be above average. It's You can s interpret this as you have a deck of cards, well, that deck is stacked in favor of it being warmer than normal. It can still be colder than normal, but this these numbers represent the percentage that it's likely to be above normal. So this is pretty likely that you're going to have, you know, above normal temperatures uh, across most of the state. Same thing for precipitation. The deck is stacked in favor of it being wetter than normal. So you look at this chart six to ten days out, and you're thinking, all right, so it looks like it's probably going to be stormy. It's going to be wet and warm. So there's probably going to be, you know, an active storm pattern across the state here. And that's about as much information as you can get out of this. You're not going to get any specifics on what, how much snow is going to fall, what the winds are going to be. Um, and that's all you can get. There are sites out there, unnamed sites that I won't talk about, that will put out a 90-day forecast. It's complete complete BS. Uh, if you're trying to make a actual specific forecast 90 days out, um, you're going to might as well just stick with climatology because that's there's no skill behind that. Um, so models go out two weeks sometimes. So this is a two-week snowfall forecast from the GFS model. Do not post uh, a 16-day forecast uh, for snowfall on your social media if it's, you know, it looks exciting because chances are it's probably not going to happen. Uh, you're not unless you have, unless it's just by pure chance, it's probably not going to verify. So for entertainment pur purposes only, um, don't look at specifics that far out. It's just not going to, it's not going to verify. So you start getting in now to about a week out, maybe six to 10 days. You can start looking at these major large scale features, the general pattern um, that might be impacting the, the state at that time. Um, there are models out there, kind of long range models, global models that we call them. And they're pretty good at picking up on these on these patterns, you know, if it's going to be a stormy pattern or if it's going to be a dry pattern, you know, a week out. Um, you really want to look for if there are agreement with other models at the same time and you have higher confidence. So this chart that I have here, this is uh, a 500 millibar height chart. So what this 
what you're looking at is the height of the 500 millibar level in the atmosphere. The 500 millibar level is a good is a good level to look at the large scale pattern. It's not really influenced by terrain that much, um, and it's kind of like the halfway point in the atmosphere. So this chart here is actually a height anomaly. So what you're looking at is you can kind of see how if you follow my mouse. The, the height contours make a ridge here. So this is what we would call an upper level ridge. And then it makes a trough uh, over the eastern part of the state in Southeast Alaska. You can call that an upper level trough. Uh, so you're kind of looking for these, uh, these patterns. And the, the darker colors here, the darker reds or the darker, deeper blues represent the strength of this system uh, compared to climatology. So if, this is, if these colors are darker, it's, going to be forecasted to be a really strong ridge of high pressure, or if it's a dark blue, uh, a deep low pressure system compared to climatology. So this site here is called Tropical Tidbits, and it's a uh, phenomenal site. A lot of us in the weather community look at it when we're at home, if you wanna try to figure out uh, what the weather's doing when we're not at work. Um, so you can go and you can pull up a bunch of different models from here. You can select different regions. So I you know, you just click on Alaska. And this chart here is called the uh, 500 height anomaly chart. Um, if you're, before I go any further, if you're worried that you're not gonna be able to write all this down or remember this, I created a uh, kind of a cheat sheet that I made for the, um, the Snow and Avalanche workshop we had earlier in the month. And there's a link to it. If Wendy or someone else wouldn't mind posting that into the chat, it has all the links that I'm talking about and kind of that, that forecast funnel that I'm talking about. So you can step through and um, kind of look at the resources that I'm using. So back to this, um, this chart here. Um, so if you go to upper dynamics, you can find this 500 millibar height anomaly. Um, so you, what you really are, are looking for is just the major uh, features. How is it progressing? You can see right now, this is the current time frame. You have a, a pretty deep upper level low over the western part of the state. And then uh, a ridge is just off screen here over the western US. And that's what's actually leading to this strong southerly flow across the Gulf Coast here that we're seeing is why we're seeing rain at sea level, really heavy rain uh, over Southeast Alaska right now. So you think the winds, like the if you follow my mouse, kind of come around the base of this trough and then as they wrap around the trough, they go from the south to the north over on top of this ridge. Um, and it kind of a tip that I would recommend, and this works for me a lot when I'm trying to find like this, you know, a short weather window is when you're in the, a progressive pattern like this um, and you want to figure out, you know, when is the pattern going to change and when's, when can I find, you know, decent weather. When this upper trough is to your, it moves to the east of you, and before the upper ridge is, uh, is moves overhead, so if the upper ridge is to your west, upper trough is over to the east of you, you're gonna find, um, have like the best chance of finding a, a weather window. So I'll kind of go forward here in time and try to find something that would resemble that. Go all the way out to next Thursday, uh, oh, well over a week from now, we call this La La Land because it's too far out in a deterministic model like this to take it super seriously, unless there's really good model agreement and the models have been consistent over time with this feature. Um, if there isn't, you're not gonna have a whole lot of confidence in this forecast this far out. But um, for the sake of this presentation, I'll just kind of show you what I'm looking at. So if you notice here, you have this upper level ridge beginning to build over the Aleutian Islands in kind of Western Alaska. And there's the remnants of this weak trough here. As this trough slowly pushes off to your east, and as the ridge is still to your west, say where you, you want to go to turning and pass, this would be actually a pretty good time to try and get out. You're having winds that are coming around over the top of the ridge. And as they come down, they're coming from the north. So it's drier. You have the best chance of it being, you know, clearer out. Um, as soon as this, if you're waiting for the ridge to be over top of you, it's too late because what's happening is the low pressure system that's over to your west is already pushing rain or snow and cloud cover over the top of this ridge. And by the time the ridge is to your west, guess what? The weather's deteriorating, the winds are kicking up and look where the wind are, winds are coming from here. They're coming from the south. So it's 
coming from a you know a moist uh, you know the ocean air is warmer and moister, so it's pulling all this moisture up here. Um, so as soon as this ridge axis begins to push overhead and to your east, um, it's time to get out of there. Weather's turning south. So that's kind of my general uh, recommendation for um, finding the weather window, just using this chart in itself. Go back to that. Kyle, real quick, we yeah. had a quick uh, question that I think people would uh, appreciate, but it's um, sure. when you say compared to climatology, what do you mean What about what is climatology? It's the the climatological average of the 500 millibar height for this time of year is really what it's comparing to. Um, so if you see a, you know, in this, this image here, if you see a really, you know, dark red, it means that these are, this is a very strong ridge for this time of year and vice versa for um, these dark blues. If you see like really anomalously low, dark blue, um, upper level low, it means it's pretty strong for this time of year. So if you see it over, you know, in the middle of winter or beginning of winter when the pattern usually had these big, you know, storm systems, that's saying something. So does that answer your question? Maybe I'll, we'll see if they, they write back in, but um, climatology, is that your 30 year, you're kind of comparing against your 30 um, year average? Yeah, actually you can see at the top here. 1981 to 2010 climatology. So that's your 30 year climo average. Yeah, I got a thumbs up, answered the question. Awesome. All right. So, as I said before, um, you can't take too much con or stock in these models unless there's good agreement with other models and there's good agreement within each model run. And you can go back and look at what's cool about this site is you can go back and look at different model runs by hitting the, the down arrow on your keyboard. So, if I do that, Here's the previous model run. Look what happened. It completely flip-flopped from the previous model run. So what does that tell me? I'm not going to put a lot of confidence in this forecast this far out. The model doesn't know what's going on. It's every run it's it has a new solution for this time frame. So all right. So now we're in three to five days. We call this the medium range. We can start looking at our global or lower resolution models and looking at individual storm systems, individual, you know, low pressure areas at the surface. Still though, the resolution in these models is a little bit too coarse to accurately depict lo the local effects that we see here in Alaska, especially in our complex terrain. For example, you know, the down slope that we see over Anchorage or the strong winds through turning an arm, any of the local effects you see in the mountains. These models, they might try to depict that, but they're generally not going to do that good of a job. So it's just, again, uh, we call it a fuzzy look um, that far out of what to expect. It's a little bit better, I guess, to call it definition than looking at the upper level chart six to 10 days out. But still, um, you might not want to use this to make you know game day decisions, per se, this far out. And to find this specific chart, you can go to precip moisture in here, and you can go to uh, the specific chart here is the mean sea level pressure and precipitation, and it delineates the uh, if it's snow or rain here. So again, it's like just a good quick look to see, you know, what's the the storm track, where are the low pressure systems. You can see the this huge atmospheric river just crushing northern Panhandle right here. Um, so yeah. All right. So here's an example of why these models, you know, three days out might not be the best if you're just trying to figure out how much snow is going to fall. So last month, I guess two months ago, month and a half ago, end of October, we kind of had our first snowfall event um, in South Central. And the there's a bunch of different discrepancies in how much snow was going to fall between the different models. So this is actually a screenshot from the Windy uh, app. I know a lot of people use this app. It's pretty cool. It has good visualizations and graphics. But again, the Windy app just loads raw model data. There's no forecaster, you know, um, in uh, changing the, the this data. So again, it's just model data. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. And the problem here is the resolution of the, the model. So the Euro model, the European model, was showing, you know, foot to two feet across um, the Gulf Coast here, and even uh, four or five inches of snow over the Anchorage area. 
the same time, the, the global, the American model, the GFS, was showing almost a foot of snow over Anchorage. And this is three days out. A uh, foot of snow over Seward, Whittier, and Valdez. Um, guess what happened? All these sites end up getting zero snowfall. So what happened here? Um, this system was pretty complex. It had uh, just a lot of different weird local effects. Some warm air at the surface that kept everything rain at sea level. Did pretty well up in the mountains. You know, they, they did get a bunch of snow out of this. Turned into our facet layer we have at the, the ground now. But these these um, sea level sites like Valdez, no snow, Whittier, no snow. You would have been pretty bummed out if you were hoping for two feet of snow at Whittier and they end up, end up getting two inches of rain at Whittier instead. So you cannot take these um, model solutions um, as a perfect forecast. The same, this is another way of looking at it. This is um, from Iowa State. They have a cool site that plots model data and this is a snow accumulation forecast. So this is the GFS in the blue and dark blue, two different runs of the GFS was showing eight to 12 inches of snow for Anchorage. Um, meanwhile, the North American model, which is a little bit higher resolution model than the GFS, was only showing about an inch or less of snow over Anchorage. So you have huge disagreement here. And how do you deal with this if you're just trying to figure out, if you're trying to make a forecast and your own personal forecast for you know wherever you're going and whatever you're doing? It's, it's difficult. Um, and what happened here, actually, the NAM ended up verifying the best out of this storm for uh, the Anchorage area. So what do you do? Yeah. I just want to jump in real quick because um, Galen Hecht has a question here that is for Wendy, the app you just had up. Or the, uh... This guy, yeah. Yep. So um, you have the NAM, the ECMWF, and the GFS to choose from. Mm -hmm. and do you have a recommendation for which one to follow or the unique benefits of the different ones? Mm, oh, and that's a loaded, that's a loaded I question. Know. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's nice about Windy, I guess, is that they do bring in a little bit higher resolution data for the EC model, for the Euro model. So that does tend to do pretty well. Um, I would say for like one to two days out, you want to look at the NAM. It has just better spatial resolution. So it's able to depict um terrain a little bit better but each model has its biases each model has its, the things that it's good or bad at and uh, it's just that's a a load of information to try and and explain um in this short amount of time but there really is no like perfect model each you look at one model for one storm and it'll nail it and you think all right i'm going to use it for the next storm and guess what it blows it so that's just the the reality of it up here um, so you kind of want to look at all three, and if there's good agreement, then you have higher confidence uh, in your forecast. If there isn't, you, you're going to have to wait until there is. Or, oh, this is a good segue into the next part, or you can rely on the professionals, the experts. So I'll kind of jump in, and you know, when you're three to five days out, you can start looking at the National Weather Service forecast. So if you're in the Anchorage area, go to weather.gov slash Anchorage, pull up this map here. You can click anywhere on this map to get a point forecast. So these forecasts are produced um, at least twice a day by forecasters in the office that are staffed 24-7. These forecasters, a lot of them uh, have been here for 10 years, 20 years more. They've seen everything that you can imagine here. Um, and they have a lot of experience. They know the local effects really well. And they're editing these forecasts uh, for you. Um, they're pouring over the data over and over and over again. They put so much work into it. So if you're just confused and overwhelmed, I would just rely on, on the experts and uh, to help uh, you know make your decision, make your forecast. So weather.gov slash Anchorage, you click on any point in the map and it'll give you this, uh, this point forecast. Hopefully you've, everyone here has at least seen this. Um, you can also find, go to mobile weather gov pull up a mobile friendly version of this so what's cool is the map is divided up by into three kilometer by three kilometer grid cells across all of alaska and there's three offices um, that split the state of alaska up so the Juneau office covers all of southeast the anchorage office covers everything from 
the far western end of the Aleutian Islands all the way over to Cordova and everything south of the Alaska Range, including southwest Alaska. And the Fairbanks office covers everything else, everything that's north of the Alaska Range in the Arctic. So i got three offices that are looking at this for you. And um, so the weather or the, the forecast is split up into these three kilometer grid cells. So you can click on a grid cell. Let's say you want to look at the top of Denali. There's a grid cell that covers the top of Denali and you could save that link. And every time you pull it up, it would show you the updated forecast for the top of Denali. Um, so it's pretty neat. And this is coming directly from our forecast database. So this is the forecast that the actual human forecasters are editing and, uh, and updating throughout the, uh, throughout the day. Uh, if you all want to look at it visually, at the bottom of the page, this hourly weather forecast, click on it and it pulls up a graph right from our forecast database of you know, temperature. You can look at wind speeds, wind direction, wind gust, probability of precipitation, and um, total amount of precip and snowfall. Uh, I believe it's three days that we put snowfall forecast uh, or snowfall amounts in our forecast. Anything past that, there's too much uncertainty, so you won't see any for, uh, forecasted snowfall amounts past three days. Another really good thing uh, to look at if you really want to get into the weather and to, to understand what uh, the forecasters are thinking is to pull up the forecast discussion. So on our main page, just click go to forecast tab and then click forecast discussion. So this is produced twice a day in um, the early morning and in, in the uh, early evening. And what it is, it's just a almost like a plain language forecast and it the forecasters write this and they're kind of putting in their thought process, why they chose this solution, what are the other solutions out there, what might pan out, but what is the most likely solution or what's the confidence in their forecast? So this is a really good way to judge, you know, how confident they are in what, uh, what they're putting out. Um, so I would recommend uh, reading this, you know, especially if you're, um, you know, trying to make your own forecast, just get a good idea of what the weather's doing. There's a long-term discussion. So it covers days three or four all the way out to day seven. So that's really good if you're, you know, a week out, five days out to see what um, is coming. And they talk a lot about confidence and model agreement um, and what's likely what's not uh, going to happen. So I would, you know, if you're interested in weather, if you want to know more, I would read this um, uh, routinely in your, in your you know, daily process. So Hi. now, yeah. Can I just jump in quick? We have a couple questions here wanting to know a little bit more about the algorithm for the point and click. And uh, one, one question here says, it seems like a year or two ago this changed and now, we, and now you describe it with a three kilometer block. Can you just explain quick how that point and click grabs that point data? Yeah, I'll go back to this. Um, so I tried to describe it. So how it works when we produce the, the point forecast is we actually aren't editing every single grid point manually, right? If we're not, that would be impossible. There's 80,000 grid points in our, just our domain, it's in Anchorage itself. What we're doing is um, we're pulling in model data across our whole domain and using our, you know, our skill, our experience, um, local knowledge. We're choosing what model we think is going to be correct. Or we, a lot of times we blend models across the whole domain. And then that is split up into these little grid cells. So when you click on this, all the forecast elements in this one grid cell um, get pulled up here. So that's kind of how it works. And it's all like downscaled based on what elevation that grid cell is. It can be difficult because a three kilometer grid over really complex terrain, for example, Whittier, where you know, it goes from 5,000 feet to sea level in like a mile, and you would have that type of elevation change in one grid cell can be tough. So when you're trying to figure out, you know, let's say you're looking for a forecast in the Kenai Mountains uh, at 4,000 feet, you want to click around a little bit and look down here. If you can see where my mouse is, it shows you the average elevation of the grid cell. So it's the average elevation um, of the terrain inside this grid cell and averages out. So you kind of want to click around and try to find the grid cell that matches your uh, elevation uh, that you're looking for. 
be most representative of the, the forecast. Um, I hope that answers your question, um, kind of how the, uh, where the weather comes from, from the grid cell. Is there anything else I can clarify? I think that's good. Okay, second question. Oh, I don't know if this is a good time for that, this or maybe later, but um, Russell from Ski AK is wondering about the AAWU4 panel and your thought on that. Oh, are you, okay, he's referring to the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit uh, 4 panel. I can pull that up real fast, I think. We can uh, save that yeah. one till the end too. Yeah, let's, yeah, we can save that for later. That's a good point. Um, we can talk about some of the aviation uh, weather products out there. Was that it for now? Yep. Okay, keep going. So forecast discussion, read that routinely. All right, so now you're within one to two days of uh, your outing, of your, your big trip. What can you start looking at? Well, if you want these high resolution models, um, uh, or you can start looking at these. So this is an example from the HER model, it stands for a high resolution rapid refresh model. It's a three kilometer model. Whereas like the NAM GFS, uh, the NAM I think is like a nine or a 12 kilometer, GFS is a 20 kilometer. Um, so this is, these, are, these models, as you get, uh, the resolution gets higher and higher. It's able to resolve you know, mountain ranges or even individual mountains if it's a big mountain. Um, and what's neat is it can show you local effects. Doesn't mean it's gonna be accurate, but it can depict local effects if they're gonna happen. So this is an example of the HER 10 meter wind forecast. Um, so you can interpret that as the wind at the surface. And what's cool is this is during a northerly outflow wind event. So high pressure building in with a low departing to your east. And the winds are beginning to come down from the north and they'll funnel through Cook Inlet here. They'll get, they'll actually, you'll see a reverse turning an arm wind where the winds go from the west to the east out of turning an arm through Whittier. And it actually depicts that, you can see that here, the wind barbs depict where the wind's coming from. So you can see the winds are pouring out of turning an arm, pouring out of the bays and passes through Resurrection Bay um, along the, uh, the Kenai uh, Mountains here. So these models will actually show stuff like that. Again, um, there are issues with high resolution models. So um, a lot of times they can overdo it, uh, especially in terms of precipitation, but it does, uh, it shows you, you know, potentially what's gonna happen in terms of local effects in complex terrain. So link here for the HER model, again, and that's in the, uh, the document that I think was posted earlier. Um, so one to two days out now, you can start looking at our, um, our recreation forecast that we made for the avalanche community. So if you go to local programs and avalanche information, this rec forecast is produced um, twice a day and it covers uh, three zones. So it covers uh, Turnigan Pass, including Girdwood. It covers Thompson Pass and Hatcher Pass. And I'll pull that up here, the current one. The, I'll make a plug for the, the Avalanche Center's website. Their weather page is awesome. It's kind of like a one-stop shop for everything you need. They have the point and click for these locations here. They got the link to the rec forecast. They got some satellite imagery, radar imagery, surface analysis. So it's kind of a good one-stop shop if you want to look for weather data. But I'll pull up our current rec forecast. So again, I said it's for Turning an Arm, Thompson Pass, and Hatcher Pass. So the the, uh, the weather variables that we forecast for are temperature at 1,000 feet and 3,000 feet. So, you know, for, Tom, for turning in passes, it's gonna be at the road and then at above tree line. Chance of precipitation, uh, precipitation amount. So that's liquid water. So that's either rain or the liquid equivalent of snow and the snow amount above uh, 1,000 feet. And what's really important here is the snow level. That's really important, especially for this system that we're dealing with right now. We've got really high snow levels up to almost 2,500 feet uh, this evening, tonight, and into tomorrow. And it gives you winds along 3,000 foot ridges, which you can uh, kind of use for like the exposed um, ridge line wind speeds. For the, just a, so you know, the turning an arm, uh, rec forecast covers a pretty big area. So you're gonna see some some large ranges here, especially when the snow levels are, you know, as high as they are. So you're gonna have snow 
you know, no snow at, at 1,000 feet, and you're going to have a, you know, a foot of snow up high above 3,000 feet. So just be aware of that and kind of use the snow amount and the snow level in combination to determine, uh, you know, what kind of weather you're going to, you can expect. So this is produced in the morning, um, probably like 4 or 5 a.m., and then uh, afternoon one comes out about here, 4 p.m. So it's valid for two periods. And they got some good remarks in here too. Uh, so it's definitely um, look at this before you head out um, if you're going into these three zones. All right, so your trip's coming up. Let's say it's the night of, you're trying to figure out what to do, where to go, or it's even the morning of, you're trying to get a quick snapshot before you head out to the car and go up the road uh, to the pass. So what we can start looking at uh, what has already happened and what is happening right now. We call that now casting. So you're making a sh very short-term forecast, like six, 12 hours out based on current conditions. So to do that, we like looking at satellite and radar data, and then also current weather station observations. And I'll show you where to get that. So for satellite data at home, this site is called College of DuPage. They have this awesome satellite site um, that has all the recent GO-16 and GO-17 satellite data. So GO-17 was added a few years ago and that is, uh, the domain is over the Western US and it covers Alaska. So it's really nice. You get some pretty nice high resolution imagery, good loops uh, over Alaska. So to start out, you want to, again, think, start big and then go and um, end small, end local. So to start big, you can choose a different sector here. So I'm in the global sector, and this is looking at pretty much all the Pacific uh, Ocean here. And this shot is the lower level water vapor. So it's showing you how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. And it's good for looking for large scale patterns in the atmosphere. So what do you see here? You see this nice upper ridge or sorry, upper trough digging all the way south, almost to like 35 degrees south in, or north in latitude. And you see this huge upper ridge right over the Western US and this red is like really dry air. And what do you see here? This is what we call an atmospheric river, or we call it the Pineapple Express, because it's digging almost as far south as Hawaii and pulling up all this warm, moist air and uh, throwing it up to uh, southeast Alaska, where they're getting fire hose right now. So again, this is a good thing to look at when you're starting out. Now you want to start getting a little bit more regional. So you can click on like a regional sector or a continental sector. So I like looking at this one because it has all of Alaska. Again, water vapor imagery, uh, good tool to look at um, to see the pattern, this incredible fire hose. And you want to then start looking at more of a localized sector. Um, so if you go to localized, you can go to Alaska, and then you'll get an anchorage sector here. So it's pretty nice. Now, when you're this zoomed in, the like water vapor or infrared imagery uh, is going to be a little blurry, maybe not might not be as useful. So we can look at like a visible um, satellite imagery. Unfortunately in Alaska, we only have a few hours in the middle of winter of visible imagery, but it's still good to look at. Um, so you can see kind of a, a grayscale um, uh, satellite imagery, satellite loop. You can see actually, I think this is the Wrangell Mountains here showing up, um, little sucker hole over them. Another uh, loop I like to look at is the day cloud phase. So this is kind of a combination of different um, uh, different uh, satellite images, and it's good. Another way of differentiating cloud types or cloud heights um, uh, during the daytime. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so we can see maybe some some more interesting features. Um, so you notice here the bright red or orange represent high clouds. And uh, if you see my mouse is the kind of, I don't know, like light blue um, colors represent low clouds near the surface. So you can kind of get an idea of high clouds, low clouds. Over here, you notice this kind of neon green. That's actually snow cover above uh, like tree line. So that shows up really well in this, in this loop um, if you're looking for like snow cover in the mountains. Uh, it's another one I like to look at. And then at night, we have this nighttime microphysics. So this actually is a little bit higher resolution loop for nighttime viewing, a little bit higher resolution than the water vapor or infrared imagery. So 
to kind of interpret this, the this yellow or brighter color is low clouds here. And again, the red or uh, darker colors here are higher clouds. So you kind of get an idea of the cloud depth here. And it does a good job of showing low level like clouds or even fog over the, the valleys during a cl clear period. So you wouldn't be able to see that at night if you're looking at water vapor or infrared. So you would look at the nighttime rocket physics to get an idea uh, if there's like fog or low clouds hanging around that you wouldn't otherwise notice. All right, so yeah, again, I recommend, recommend checking out the site, play around. Um, I have links in uh, that document that was shared. So satellite and then radar. So radar coverage in Alaska is pretty thin. You don't have a lot of radars. <clears throat> and the problem is, over um, the mountains, the radars tend to get blocked. So we have two radars that we could really use for South Central. The first one is the Middleton Island radar that shows precipitation, say from like Cordova over the Prince William Sound area. And then the Kenai radar, which shows precipitation moving up Cook Inlet and would be good for anchorage. The thing is by the time it gets to like Hatcher Pass or even North, the radar beam is overshooting the precipitation. So you might it might not pick up all the precip by the time it gets that far north. The same thing uh, with the Middleton Island radar, like Thompson Pass, you're probably not gonna pick up a whole lot of, um, of returns of precipitation over Thompson Pass with this radar. And the, the Kenai Mountains, like Turning Pass is kinda, it sucks, it's right in the middle of this, this dead zone. You're getting beam blockage on both sides from both radars by the mountains. So um, you kinda have to, you know, look at both radars and make uh, your your best judgment on what's going on in Turnigan Pass. Um, again, the the Chugach Avalanche Center's uh, weather page, they have the radar loops here, um, both Middleton Island and Kenai Radar, because I've got some outages. But good to look at that to see what's going on, get a little now cast going. Um, and the other thing you'll look at is weather stations. So there's a couple different areas you want to look at or places you want to look at for weather observations. So this one we use a lot. This is a uh, National Weather Service map and I'll pull it up here. It's pretty neat. It has a lot of cool features that you can use to look at lots of weather stations. So we pull in any weather station that we can find here and it's plotted on this map. Um, so what you're looking at here is um, <clears throat> the, you got temperature here and you, this represents the winds. These are wind barbs, if you know how to read that. So you can see here the winds are kind of coming from east, southeast to uh, northwest here on the upper hillside. Uh, you can, instead of displaying the station plot, you can display just air temperature. So if you zoom in over Alaska, we got all the Alaska stations plotted here. So you can get a good idea of like the temperature profile as you go up the mountain. Uh, you can see our freezing level here. If you click on this station, it pulls up uh, Alaska weather top of Max's Mountain, that's 3,200 feet. So our freezing level is right at th about 3,200 feet uh, over Alaska. And if you wanted to, you can look at the weather history by clicking on this link, three day, or you can look at seven day history. And it pulls up the last three days of observations, well, whatever was available. So it's a good way to see what happened in the past while looking at what's currently happening. You can also look at precipitation. So if you can change to see how much precipitation fell within the last 12 hours or six hours or even the last three days, you can see we got you know quite a bit of precipitation over the last three days over Alaska. You can zoom over and see what a Turnigan Pass snow tail has shown up here, three and a half inches of precip over the last three days. It's pretty good. So play, if you um, decide to use this, play around with it. You can look at historical data. Um, you got wind gusts, you can overlay wind gusts on here. Um, so it's pretty intuitive and uh, has a lot of data, uh, but it's it's nice because it's all um, pretty organized and easy to read. So yeah, we look at these maps all the time when we're forecasting. Another map that we have is, if you haven't seen this yet, this is the Alaska Snow Depth map. It's actually hosted by the uh, River Forecast Center, who I work for. <clears throat> so this map, and I'll go to it here, plots any and all um, station that reports snow depth. So we scour the web um, database and we plot any station that has snow depth on this map. And what's really cool is it actually plots the last 30 days and it has this algorithm that smooths out all these spikes you see. So this blue, these, these blue lines, this is the raw data coming from the, the Turnigan Pass snow station. And when it snows, 
um, when it's, especially when it's snowing really heavy, the snowflakes get in between the snowed up sensor and the top of the snowpack. And the sensor thinks that it's, the snowpack is a lot higher than it actually is. And what's cool is this algorithm um, smooths out that data. So you get a nice realistic looking uh, snow depth plot instead of these big spikes here. And a new feature we added last year was you can compare the current um, snow depth plot of the current year to all the previous years if they're available. So this goes back to 2004, 2005 season for Turnigan Pass for snow depth. And if you hover over it, it'll highlight the snow depth plot uh, to the left of it. So you can see, hey, how do we, how are we comparing so far to like 2011, 2012? Well, the good news is we're actually way above average, which is the black line, and we are actually above 2011, 2012 uh, for this time of year, for the first of December. Um, the current value we have in here is, oh, I can't see it. Looks like it's not up to date. So this is from the 27th of November, 65 inches. We actually peaked out at 74 inches um, this morning before it changed to rain. So if we were to extrapolate that out, we're actually probably number one or number two highest snow depth on record for December 1st at Turning and Pass. That's pretty exciting. Um, it's good to, to see. I think we had the same thing for Anchorage Hillside. Anchorage Hillside, <clears throat> yeah, we're we're at we're actually number one, so the highest snow depth on record for Anchorage Hillside this time of year. So we got a good snowpack going. So keep moving, running out of time here. So again, uh, to summarize, the forecast funnel you start you start large and then you narrow down to small scale. You start um, uh, far out in time and then you end you know 24 hours out. So that's kind of how the forecast funnel works. Um, before I take any questions on that, I'm going to jump through this. I know I'm kind of running out of time for uh, this, but I'm going to go through the winter, our winter weather outlook real fast. Hey, Kyle, Kyle, no rush. You're doing okay. well. Yeah. Okay, good. I know it's almost eight, but I got till 815, right? Yep. All right. Awesome. Some questions. So I think we're doing well. Good. Okay. So um, everyone kind of has probably already heard that we're in a, a La Nina year. Um, so just to quickly go over what is a El Nino or a La Nina, this is part of the ENSO index or the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. And all it really is, is it describes the sea surface temperature anomaly of the South Pacific. So during a El Nino year, we typically have above average sea surface temperatures over the South Pacific and vice versa for a La Nina year. You're probably like, all right, how the heck does that impact weather in Alaska? <clears throat> it's so far away. How it doesn't, you know, it's not really that intuitive. Well, what, what's, if you can kind of think about this conceptually, when you have a, you know, warmer than normal sea surface temperatures, you're likely gonna have warmer than normal um, and more moist air over the South Pacific. That's actually going to um, amplify the Pacific um, storm track. So what's going on is you still have really cold air during the winter over the Arctic. When you have above average temperatures over the South Pacific, that temperature gradient is um, increases a lot. And when that happens, you get a more active and amplified storm track. So you end up getting what we're seeing now actually is a, these, a lot of these low, you know, atmospheric rivers are really strong low pressure systems that just shove a lot of warm, moist air up north. And it ends up keeping a lot of the cold air at bay uh, more often throughout the winter. So we end up seeing warmer, wetter temperatures across, you know, the, the Gulf Coast and into Southeast Alaska over, you know, most of the state, uh, the, say Southeast part of the state um, during El Nino years. Well, during La Nina years, which are in now, that temperature gradient because sea surface temperatures are below average then that means the equatorial temperatures are going to be below average that temperature gradient is going to be a little bit less we're going to have more of a weaker jet stream our our storm track is going to be a little bit more variable and this is going to allow that colder air that's bottled up to kind of more easily push south 
like we would expect for Alaska, right? You're not going to have as many of these really warm, moist storm tracks. So we tend to we tend to see more cold, dry um, winters uh, during La Nina years. Um, there's a pretty strong correlation to below average temperatures and La Nina years for the state. Um, so yeah, I kind of summarized this. In terms of snowfall though, I found there's hardly any correlation to snowfall amount when I was looking at like mountain sites, you know, Turnigan Pass, Thompson Pass, Hatcher Pass. Um, so I kind of wanted to see how, you know, what did last winter look like? Last winter, it was saying it was gonna be um, warmer than normal and wetter than normal across the state. Well, it was kind of a big bust in terms of temperature last winter was the coldest winter we had statewide since 1999. So that didn't pan out too well. In terms of precipitation, though, it was a little bit better. We actually had one of the wettest, snowiest years on record in the interior. And even as you, a lot of us know, like Sisseton Valley um, had a ton of snow, a lot of precipitation. So we were you know, above average in terms of precip for last winter. Um, with the exception of the Kenai Peninsula, it was really bad last year in terms of, of total precipitation. It was almost low, uh, record low precip for the Kenai. So it's kind of a weird anomaly last year. So we look at two snowpacks. Last winter, Turnigan Pass, as I said, it was you know well below the average in terms, in terms of temperatures, but precipitation only 70% of normal and the peak snow water equivalent or how much snowpack we have that peaks in April is actually only half of normal. And here's a, a graph of it last winter. You know, we were so far below average, this green line here. We actually, by the time we hit April and May, we were the lowest, we had the lowest snowpack on record for the spring for Turnigan Pass. So it was pretty bad. Same thing for uh, Mount, for Alieska. They were below normal. Uh, and they had really just half of our peak snowpack. Um, here's a look at precipitation. So we were just drier than normal last year. And Hatcher Pass, we were well below normal, but we had a record snowpack that year. We had last year we had 168% uh, normal of precip. Our peak snowpack was 170% of normal. We had a record snowpack. I think our snow depth topped out up out there of over 100 inches. I want to say it was almost 120 inches. Um, almost 10 feet of snow. So it buried that snow, that snow stake by uh, early March here. I mean, there's a look at uh, precipitation graph of Independence Mine. So pretty much record precip, record high precip through most of the winter. So this year, uh, the Climate Prediction Center is predicting that we will have over the eastern part of the state and southeast Alaska, uh, slightly better chances that we're gonna see colder than normal temperatures and a little bit better chance that we're going to have drier than normal uh, precipitation for our area. So our La Nina strength, so this is kind of a model of a bunch of different models showing how strong the La Nina is. Negative numbers, more negative means stronger La Nina, vice versa for El Nino. So the models are kind of showing that we're going to be in this um, this moderate to strong uh, La Nina. So what I wanted to do was see, hey, Modern and strong La Ninas, how did the winter look those years in our recreation areas? So I went through and kind of looked at what a La Nina year uh, is uh, looks like for us. And I was also talking to a coworker of mine. He's really good and expert in like teleconnections and these large scale cycles. And he says, looking at a bunch of diff different indices that the 2010 and 2011 winter um, is matching our winter so far the closest in terms of these indices. So I'll also show how the 10-11 winter looked. So Turnigan Pass, an average you know, year with a strong or moderate La Nina, uh, we're three and a half, over uh, three degrees below normal. Precip, it went both ways. Some years had um, well above average precip, other years well below normal, average precip. So it was just slightly below normal on the whole. Peak snow snowpack exactly the same, just about normal for a La Nina year. So not a lot of correlation with you know, snowfall and precipitation. 2010, 2011, it was colder than normal in Turnigan Pass. Uh, precipitation was about normal, a little bit below, but the snowpack was actually, for some reason, uh, the peak snowpack that year was only about 66% of normal. So a little bit colder and a little bit you know, less 
uh, snowpack that year in 2010-11. For Alaska, pretty much the exa exactly the same as Turnigan Pass. Uh, lining years are colder, but in terms of precip, no correlation there. And 2011 and uh, 2010, 2011 winter was colder and uh, less snowy than uh, than normal. Hatcher Pass, I kind of blow through this because there were only two years that were moderate or stronger La Ninas, and um, they had you know, those two years were uh, below average temperatures and just slightly below normal um, precip and snowpack. But only two years, so we can't take a lot of stock in that. If you quickly go over Valdez. Uh, Valdez is interesting. So a little bit colder during La Nina years, normal precip, but snowfall. Snowfall was above average for La Nina years. I think the reason is Valdez itself is still going to be a wet place regardless if it's on the Inyo La Nina. Um, but when it's colder than normal, more of that snowfall is going to, or more of that precipitation is going to fall as snowfall. So you can expect, you know, we're going to just have more snowfall at sea level than uh, normal during these years. And they've Thompson Pass, uh, we have a good snowfall record there at the DOT station. So during La Nina years, only 102% of normal. 2010 in uh, Valdez was average for a La Nina year, eight degrees or about a degree to below, below normal for temperatures. Only uh, a little bit drier, a uh, little bit less snow than normal. Same thing for Thompson Pass, a little, little bit less snowfall than normal. So to kind of summarize everything, this season, as we are heading into another moderate to strong La Nina, we're expecting there to be a pretty good chance that statewide we're going to be a lot colder than normal. Then we're uh, especially considering what we've been used to the last couple of years with um, really warm temperatures across the state. So that's good because precipitation is just not a lot of correlation. We don't know. It's just hard to say. There's a lot more variables that go into how much precip and snow you're going to get um, than just a uh, if it's a La Nina or El Nino year. Um, but I think we can conclude that colder than normal means we're going to have a lot less of these, you know, really warm, wet storms. Of course, as I say that, that's what, exactly what we're getting right now. But they're going to occur a lot less than if it's an El Nino year. Like the 2015, 2016, it was a bad year up here. Just warm storm after warm storm after warm storm. Um, and this, this snowpack just never got a chance down at sea level. So this year, as we already seen, snowpack down the sea level, almost record snowpack in places so far. So um, I think <clears throat> I think so far, I think it's gonna be a really good year. Um, out here, I think the snow, we're gonna have a good snowpack. Uh, the only downside is if we do have these prolonged cold dry periods in the middle of winter, what does that lead to in terms of avalanche danger? Well, it leads to you know, higher likelihood of these persistent weak layers developing. And when you end up do getting a pattern shift then you're gonna have you know, a little bit heightened avalanche danger uh, through the year that this will kind of last a little bit longer than if you were to have um, you know, a, a deeper, warmer snowpack. So. Um, good thing is that 2011, 2012 was another strong or moderate La Nina year, and that was an awesome snow year, if anyone, anyone remembers that. We had record snowfall here in Anchorage, 900 inches at Alaska, and the skiing was awesome. Um, not a lot of chance for the for weak layers to develop in the snowpack because you just, you just keep burying those and keep burying them deeper and deeper. So let's cross our fingers that uh, that'll happen this year as well. Okay, I think I'm all done. Any questions? Yeah, there are a few questions here, Kyle, but um, I think we all remember the 11 12 year. Yeah, <laughs> it's my first winter up here. I thought that's how all winters were in Alaska. And then the next yeah, year, right. I was really disappointed. <laughs> Every nine years. Yeah. <laughs> Neil, Neil has a question here, and he wants to know what accounts for such a big difference between precip and peak SWE when you were showing those. Graphs. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, I was actually wondering the same thing. I didn't really get a chance to go back and look at that. Um, where was that? I think it was for Turnigan Pass in Alaska, 2010, 2011. Um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting artifact there. My best guess would be maybe we did have some 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 rainfall events where 
um, that just kind of kept the, the, the snowpack down a little bit, or maybe, I mean, this is peak, uh, SWE, so this usually occurs in, you know, beginning of April. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone else was around during that winter, if anyone like Scott Hilliard, I thought I saw you on, I'm not sure if you remember that winter, but yeah, it is definitely an interesting, uh, artifact that I just that you came across um yeah I was um I was here that winter and I remember I think it was like a five week dry spell and there were anti-tracks everywhere if I yeah I'm remembering that right but we had a long arctic outbreak and just a long dry spell Um, so it kind of we maybe had members high precipitation earlier and then just settled out and we never were really able to build a deeper snowpack it must have like, yeah it must have fallen at a different time but if anyone has any thoughts on that year stick them in the chat um let's see what other questions i have here um if you want to go kyle to I was going to go back to Russell's question. Um, I don't see any for the outlook at the moment, unless I, if I missed one, write it in again for me. But okay. uh, yeah, Russell was wondering about the aviation, AAWU, is that Alaska Aviation Weather? <clears throat> yeah. Weather? Yeah, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit. So they're a, a separate weather unit. We're all in the same building, the River Forecast Center, the Anchorage Forecast Office. We're all in the same building and the Aviation Weather Unit. And they do statewide um, aviation specific uh, weather forecasts. Let me pull it up real fast. I'm not sure exactly about the four panel you're, you're talking about, but let me try and find it and talk about it if I can. Or maybe if he has it, you can post a link to it. I can take a look. But so they're posting, uh, they're doing very aviation specific things, specific forecasts like um, icing, turbulence, uh, cloud height, uh, flight categories, you know, if it's marginal visual flight categories or instrument uh, flight categories. So that's uh, what they're for, they're uh, forecasting for. Uh, obviously, really, really important here in Alaska. So you have so many general aviation pilots out here that use it. But I do post a good surface chart here. Um, it shows you, uh, you know, areas of low pressure, high pressure, and fronts. Um, I'm not going to get into how to read this, but uh, you can probably figure it out. And uh, I'm trying to see what else. I can find it. I don't see, it. I don't see any link there. Um, but all right, maybe this is what he's talking about—the SIG weather charts. I think Kyle. I just, I think Christopher um, sent the four-panel link that I just am putting in the chat. If you can see that in the chat. Yep. Let me copy and paste it into my browser. Okay, yeah, so this is significant weather at the surface. All right, so if you kind of want to figure out how to read this, so obviously low, this is a low pressure system. This is the millibar or the uh, the surface pressure in millibars. Um, 980 is a decent, so your average low pressure system in Alaska. Um, the, the shaded colors here is uh, red is in, instrument flight, uh, rules, meaning uh, ceiling and vis are below a thousand feet and three miles, or a thousand feet and one mile. Uh, marginal, they're a little bit higher than that. And then it shows you areas of low-level turbulence, meaning strong winds over over mountains or wind shear uh, that we see in Anchorage. It's going to be highlighted here. Um, and then it also provides the uh, freezing levels. So these dash lines, these dash green line, green lines here shows you the freezing level in hundreds or tens of hundreds of feet. Sorry. So the zero two zero is the freezing level is two thousand feet, four thousand feet. A red line means this freezing level is at the surface. A lot of times they will intersect if you have an inversion, where the freezing level is at the surface and also aloft. Two different freezing levels, and then it shows you fronts here. So this is a warm front, the uh, the red. 
with the half circles. And this is a cold front, the blue with the uh, triangles here. And it gives you 24 hour, 36, 48, and 60 hours. So it's a really good way to look at the surface weather out, you know, 60 hours to get a good depiction of uh, what's going on in conjunction with model data. And this is uh, analyzed by the uh, aviation forecasters. So I hope that answers your question. Is there a weather app that tells my wife how many puffy jackets to bring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if it's, yeah. Actually, in terms of weather apps, um, the Weather Service doesn't actually have a dedicated app that uh, we maintain or anything. Uh, there are some private uh, weather apps out there um, that pull our data from our forecast data and display it. And one I, I have on my phone, I have an Android, and it's uh, called NWS Now. You just get it from the Play Store, and it just pulls in our data and puts it in a nice, friendly mobile format. So. Yeah. Hey Kyle, a couple Hilliard wrote in um, for the 1011 season. Normal precip. His what he's thinking is normal precipitation with below normal temperatures equals more inches of low density snowfall equals lower SWE. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. And then, but the SWE should be the same regardless, right? The SWE is just your water. Yeah. Flow. Yeah, or if you have. I don't know how subtle sublimation or I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's tricky. And then another comment that. here: um, SWE discrepancies have to do with snow water ratios? Question mark. Do you see that one from Jay? Well, to so the the peak days. the peak SWE is just um, the peak water weight of the snowpack. So it's nothing to do with with snow height. So let's say you have thirty inches of precipitation falling through the winter. And in a um, perfect world, none of it blows away, none of it, you know, melts out. You're going to have 30 inches of snow water equivalent um, at the end of your season before it starts to melt. Does that make sense? So um, you would think there would be a strong correlation between uh, precipitation, winter precipitation, and winter peak snowpack, but there's definitely some weird discrepancy going on that year. Right. And I think, you know, you talk about sublimation. I remember re a study about that uh, when you have lower density snow sitting, that you do lose a bit of mass with sublimation mm -hmm. during cold periods. Yep. And the wind can can uh, scour the, the snow pack over that snow pillow that measures this, the SWE. <laughs> so that could, there could also be bridging over the, the snow pillow which may have accounted for that. I don't know. Bridging is where you have like an ice lens that forms mid snowpack that actually bridges the weight of the snowpack over the pillow. So the pillow doesn't record the whole weight of the snowpack that could have happened. But the fact that both Turnigan Pass and uh, Alaska Snowtail Station had the same thing is, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence or not. Yeah, interesting. But what, yeah. what is pretty cool I'm looking around, I think not, well, I'm hoping I didn't miss any questions here. Wade, if you see something, maybe send it again so I can see it. Um, but it's cool to see see how our snowpack's doing so far. We're breaking records already. It's awesome, yeah. Hillside, <laughs> Turnigan Pass, that, yeah. That was pretty fun to see. It's good to um, see, yeah. All right, it says, Wade says, I think he sees it all too. Well, if anyone, I think we'll um, wrap things up. It is 8.21, so we're coming on 8.30. And uh, I had a, one question for you, Kyle. I yeah. want to know um, when, I want to know when the next good powder day is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should call the forecast office for that. Let's see, look at the uh, point and click forecast. <laughs> or is it going to be breakable crust when it uh when it probably if you want a quick little weather forecast here all right we're going to look at the gfs all right here's that big atmospheric river am i still sharing my screen you're sharing your screen okay so you can see it good 
so that moves out. Um, this is going to be Thursday morning. So we could have a little bit of snow as this front moves out. We've got cold and dry after that. And then the next storm looks like it's forecast to come in by uh, Sunday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Looks warm though. Well, the good thing is if you look at the, the low track, kind of skirting off here to the east. So that'll keep us on the colder side of the storm. Where if the storm, the low was over here, over like Bristol Bay, then we're on the warm side of the storm and we're more likely to see higher freezing levels and rain on snow. So this could be a good one. So if you want to ski tin can trees on a powder day, maybe Sunday would be a good day. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we'll see you there. Um, yeah. Well, great, Kyle. Thank, thanks a ton. I have a lot of folks thanks. writing in thanks. And um, I'm trying to see if I had any, lots of good questions tonight, if I had any others. But, oh, there was one, actually, that yeah. I missed. And um, just really quick, when you were doing the point and click, I, I, I think it was Ed who was writing in. He said there's a mistake on one of the maps over by Skelak Lake on Kenai, on the Kenai. How oh, okay. Go about getting that fixed. Do they contact well, their service or? Uh, yeah, I think the the base map we load is from Esri, so it would be an you would have to contact Esri. Um, the like uh, send here. That's what I'm going to do. Let me find. Send an email to. Um, uh, if you go down to our, uh, where's our website here? Blah, blah, blah. Can't find it. Go back. If you go down to the bottom of our main page, you can see a contact us down here. Comments, questions, please contact us. You can send an email uh, to that whenever it pulls up. I'm not going to open that, but it'll pull up our email, our, um, our office email, and then you can put any questions you have in there. You can say, hey, this is labeled wrong. Um, can we figure out how to fix it? Uh, so that's Ed, the best way to do it. Ed just wrote in saying that he's tried that. Oh. Maybe we'll. Yeah, we'll have to um, figure out some something send, offline with you, Ed, to get yeah. that fixed. Yeah. Find uh, you can do it offline. Yeah, uh, but Ed, shoot shoot me a note at Wendy at chugachavalanche.org, and I'll try and connect you with somebody. Um, I think that's it. We will close things up. Thanks, Kyle, for everything. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Uh, or panelists. Thanks to all the attendees for attending tonight. It was super fun. Uh, I think a lot, there's a lot of weather geeks out there. Um, Heck yeah. Kind of nice to, to converge, even if it is on Zoom and not in person. And big thanks to Ski AK again for co-hosting. Russell, I know you've been watching, so thank you for all your support. Um, and to Wade and our friends group for making this Zoom opportunity happen for us. And um, Kyle, thanks again for being our local weather guru. And yeah, get the weather forecast, get the avalanche forecast, think cold thoughts. Hopefully La Nina does end up in cold for us we can deal with a yeah. few warm storms i'm okay with that right. <laughs> but yeah reset things so, a little bit yeah sounds great well thanks everyone i will let the chat run for a few minutes but um i think we can we can sign off if i can find the right buttons Kyle, when are you going skiing next? Good question. Hopefully this weekend, maybe Friday. Let me take a day off. Awesome. Yeah, Friday looks nice. <laughs> now we're all going to be out there Friday. I know, it's going to be packed. <laughs> well, just let the rain stop. Yeah, it should. Yeah. All right, everyone, I am going to close it up. And this will, I didn't mention this earlier, but we did record it. So we'll post the recording on, um, on our social media and on chugachavalanche.org's website. So that will be there if anyone missed it or, or uh, tuned in late. So thanks again, everyone have a good night.
Thanks, Kyle. All right. Thanks, everyone.